Well, hello, ladies. I hope you guys had a good Easter in spite of everything, and I hope you and your families are all doing okay. I'm going to give you a quick update on where we are and what we're going to be doing the rest of the year. I actually spent quite a bit of time this past week trying to sort out just exactly what we should and shouldn't do going forward. And I'm going to start off by talking about a couple of topics that we often do cover in calculus, but that we're going to skip this year. And it's not really because of COVID-19 that we're skipping them. It's really because of the time we missed back during basketball season when we had really about two weeks off and weren't doing anything online. The first of those topics is what's called implicit differentiation. It's really kind of an advanced version of chain rule, and you use it to find the derivatives of things that aren't functions, things that have both x and y in the same formula. Going along with that is what are called related rate problems, which are just another application of derivatives. They honestly are not the most exciting problems. They're things like if you pull a ladder out from a wall and it goes across at a certain rate, what's the rate that it's going down the wall at? And we could spend quite a while going into and mastering those problems, but there are better things that we've got our time to do this spring. If I see you ladies in the fall, I may actually go through some of these topics with you then, but we're not going to spend time doing this now. We're going to get through what we have to the rest of the year. So no, for now, you don't need to know related rates. You don't need to know implicit differentiation. So let's move on to what you do need to know and where we're going for the rest of the year. I told you clear back at the beginning of this class that there were three main topics that we study in calculus. One of those was limits, one of them is derivatives, and the third one was antiderivatives, or what are sometimes called integrals. And we are going to be spending the rest of the year learning pretty much everything there is to know and what you do with antiderivatives. Working with antiderivatives is basically like playing Jeopardy with derivatives. It's like I give you the answer and you've got to go back and find the question. A typical antiderivative problem has this weird symbol that almost looks like it belongs in music class, and then it has a function, and then it has the letters dx at the end of it. And what it means is what function has f of x for its derivative? If I want to find the antiderivative of f of x dx, that means what function would have f of x for its derivative? You read that notation as the antiderivative of f of x with respect to x, or sometimes people will say the integral of f of x with respect to x. Again, those are just different language for the same thing. While they both are, in modern times, English words, you're again looking at things Leibniz said and things Newton said and getting different language for the same thing. So you might see problems that look like this. The antiderivative of 3x squared dx, or maybe the integral of sine x dx. That symbol that you see at the beginning of those problems, you actually have seen before. It's what is traditionally called the tall S or the long S, and you've seen it if you've seen things like handwritten copies of the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, because back in the 1700s, back when Newton and Leibniz were alive, people would make the letter S when it appeared in the middle of a word with a taller version of that letter, and that came to be used in calculus to stand for sum. We'll actually talk about why that might have something to do with a sum with adding stuff up next week, but basically now it's just the integral sign or the antiderivative sign. Whenever you see a problem, the function that you have to find the antiderivative of is always written in the middle. That tall s and dx which technically stands for either with respect to x or a difference in x, those frame the function. The function's in the middle, and the antiderivative symbol's at the beginning, dx is always at the end. 
So on the left, I have the function 3x squared that I want to focus in on, and on the right, I want to focus in on sine x and find the antiderivative of that. I want to start by thinking about that first problem that I had there, the antiderivative of 3x squared dx. Again, this is asking you what function would have 3x squared as its derivative. And I want you to think about that for a minute and think, gee, what would you have to take the derivative of to get 3x squared? And I'm betting all three of you probably figured out that the answer's got to be x cubed, because if you took the derivative of x to the third power, you'd take 1 times 3, subtract 1 from the exponent, you would get 3x squared. The problem is there's not just one answer to this problem. And if you think about it a minute, you might be able to figure out why. I have a problem like the antiderivative of 3x squared. I could have started with x cubed plus 5. The derivative of that would be 3x squared. Or x cubed minus 9 or x cubed plus basically anything, if I do the derivative, I'm going to get 3x squared. The way we show that is we write our answer as x cubed plus some constant. Usually that's written as x cubed plus k. Sometimes people will write it as plus c. k actually comes from the German word for constant, which is, of course, what Gottfried Leibniz used. So when I write x cubed plus k, that means I could put x cubed plus any number I want, and that would be all the possible antiderivatives of 3x squared. There are always going to be infinitely many possible answers when you do antiderivative problems, and that is because you could add any constant at all to the main answer that you get. When you do that, you do show that by putting plus k or plus c, right at the end of the answer. When you write an answer to an antiderivative problem, you always want to put that plus k or plus c as part of your answer. That really is important. You might remember earlier I talked about Mr. Bruja, my math instructor when I was at UNI years ago. You can actually see a picture of him from an obituary there. Mr. Bruja would completely throw away problems that were turned in that didn't have the plus k or plus c on them. You got zero credit if you didn't do that. Now, I probably won't be quite as nasty to you folks, but you do want to remember that, yeah, technically there are infinitely many answers, not just the one you get when you follow the rules. So what we need to do is learn what are the rules for finding antiderivatives. You might remember that back when we were still at school, we learned a bunch of rules for finding derivatives of different kinds of functions, and it turns out there's also rules you can use for antiderivatives. Let's start with the easiest possible rule, the antiderivative of zero. You want to think what has a derivative of zero. And it's not too hard to figure out that any number at all would have a derivative of zero, which is why we say the antiderivative of zero is k. The second rule is the antiderivative of a dx. That basically means the antiderivative of some number, like what's the antiderivative of 7, or what's the antiderivative of negative 8, the antiderivative of any number at all. And the answer is you get that number x, plus k. So if I had the antiderivative of 5, the answer would be 5x plus k. Here I've got the antiderivative of 7 dx, and it's not too hard to figure out that the answer is going to be 7x plus k. So next up we have the big rule, the one that I googled a picture of an asterisk so I could put a star on this slide. This is the one you really do want to remember. It is what we call the power rule for antiderivatives, how you would take the antiderivative of something x to the something. And it tells you here that if I want to do the antiderivative of ax to the p dx, the answer is ax to the p plus 1 over p plus 1, all that plus k. 
And I want you to look at that for a minute because there's really two quick things that are going on there. We did something to the exponent, and then we divided by something. I got ax to the p plus 1 over p plus 1. So what you want to do is add 1 to the exponent, and then you divide by the new exponent. The very first example I did said the antiderivative of 3x squared. And if you think about it, you take 2 plus 1, you add 1 to the exponent, so I got cubed. And now I divide by that new exponent, 3 divided by 3 is 1, that's why my answer was 1x cubed. And of course you always throw the plus k at the end. So here I've got the antiderivative of 8x cubed dx. And I'm going to leave that there for a minute and see if you can figure out what this answer is going to be. If I add 1 to the exponent, I get x to the 4th. I've got to take 8 divided by 4, and that's why my answer is 2, x to the 4th plus k. Here's another problem. Take a look at it and see if you can find the antiderivative of 7x to the 5th. Find as you go through antiderivatives that a lot of times you have fractions that come up in the answers. Here we added 1 and got 6. I've got to take 7 divided by 6. Then the easiest way to do that is just write 7 sixths x to the 6th power plus k. Now if you wanted to write that as a decimal like 1.16 repeating, technically that's okay, but it's easiest just to write the fraction 7 sixths x to the 6th plus k. My next problem here says to find the antiderivative of the cube root of x. And before you do that, you do want to think, what would that be if I wrote it as a power, and then you follow the power rule? So take a minute and see if you can figure that out. The first step is to think about what would this would be as an exponent, and when I have a cube root, that's the same as x to the one-third power. And the power rule says we've got to add one to the exponent. That, of course, is one and a third, but what you really want to think of it as is four-thirds. So I've got one divided by four-thirds, x to the four-thirds power. Remember, when you divide by a fraction, it's the same as times the reciprocal. And that's why instead of 1 over 4 thirds, what I should write for the final answer is 3 fourths x to the 4 thirds power plus k. So again, the basic power rule, if you want to do the antiderivative of something x to the whatever, you add 1 to the whatever, and then you take something divided by whatever plus 1. Add 1 to the exponent, divide by that new exponent. I'm going to give you just a second to see if you can figure out this problem. Now if you try to use the power rule, you're going to run into some problems here, because you have x to the negative first power here, and if you add 1, negative 1 plus 1 is 0, you'd end up with 1 over 0 x to the 0, and 1 over 0 doesn't make any sense. But it turns out that all the antiderivative rules are, are just the opposites of the derivative rules that we learned a while back in calculus. And if I want to do the antiderivative of 1 over x, what I've got to do is remember that the derivative of natural log was 1 over x. And so it turns out that, yeah, the antiderivative of 1 over x is natural log plus k. Now, technically, since you can't take a log of a negative number, 
what you're supposed to write for the answer is natural log of the absolute value of x plus k, but I would accept what's written up at the middle there with no problem at all. Again, the antiderivative of 1 over x is natural log of x plus k. Next up, we want to talk about the trig rules, how you do the antiderivative of sine or cosine. And again, these are just going to be the opposites of what you already know. It turns out that the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine plus k, and the antiderivative of cosine is sine plus k. Now, the thing that's important when you do the trig rules is that the positives and negatives are the opposite of what they were with derivatives. That's because you might remember the derivative of sine was cosine, and the derivative of cosine was negative sine. Well, that's why you turn around where the negative is when you do the antiderivative. So the antiderivative of sine x, again, is negative cosine x plus k, and the antiderivative of cosine x will be sine x plus k. My bet is all three of you know the answer to this one if you just think about it for a second. The antiderivative of e to the x. And hopefully you guessed right that that's going to be e to the x, or e to the x plus k. So e is both its own derivative and its own antiderivative. We're going to toss in one more rule that we didn't do back when we were doing derivatives. This says the antiderivative of b to the x power. That would be like the antiderivative of 10 to the x, or 5 to the x, or 5 billion to the x. If I have something other than e to the x power, and I want to take the antiderivative of that, it tells you the answer is b to the x over the natural log of b. You just have whatever you started with, but then you divide by the natural log of that number. And of course, like always, you toss in plus k at the end. So the antiderivative of anything to the x is anything to the x over the natural log of anything plus k. So think for a minute, what would this answer have to be? The antiderivative of 2 to the x dx. And it is going to be 2 to the x over natural log of 2 plus k. So now we got something that throws just about everything all together in one problem. I want you guys to take a minute, look through this, and see if you can figure out what the answer is going to be. And we'll give you probably 30 seconds or so to do this one. The real trick to this is just to go through and do one step at a time. So the first part is do the antiderivative of 5x to the 6th. You add 1 to the exponent, you divide by the new exponent, and I wrote that as 5 sevenths x to the 7th. Sometimes people will write 5x to the 7th all over 7. That's okay too, it's the exact same thing. Then I look at the antiderivative of square root of x. Well, square root would be the same thing as x to the 1 half power. I add 1, and I get 3 halves. If you divide by 3 halves, that's the same as times 2 thirds. So that's why it says plus 2 thirds x to the 3 halves. Next, we do the antiderivative of minus e to the x. The minus just tags along, and that's why my answer is minus e to the x. And the last part is the antiderivative of sine x. Well, we did that as one of the rules earlier. It's negative cosine x. And my final answer then is 5 sevenths x to the seventh plus 2 thirds x to the 3 halves minus e to the x minus cosine x plus k. Just tag it all along one step at a time, and they all go together for your answer. So that's a quick idea of how to find antiderivatives. 
So you have an idea of where we're going from here. Next week we will be actually putting numbers with those and finding values. And after that, we'll figure out the main application, which deals with finding areas and volumes. That's one of the biggest uses of antiderivatives. At the end of all my videos this week, I threw in a picture that you might remember seeing on my bulletin board clear back at the beginning of the year. And it just seems appropriate with the pandemic that we're dealing with right now to think about a pandemic that could actually be a good thing. So, you know, you want to keep in mind that it could be good to have a pandemic of kindness. With that, I will tell you we're back to having a regular quiz online this week. And so you do want to make sure that you go through, make sure you understand the problems, and then do take the online quiz. And we'll wish you a good week. I hope everything goes well for you.